Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our, I think this is about our 103rd episode of uh, Race and Policing, Committee on Race and Policing. And we have, all of our guests are very special, but we have a very special returning guest. So we must have treated her well the first time she was here, Professor Vita Johnson from Georgetown University. Um, we will get into um, deeper introductions uh, as we go along. But for now, I'm Mary Texera, and I am just here to welcome you and to pass it on to my colleague, um, Robbie Madrigal, who will be doing the land acknowledgement. Thank you, it's Robbie Madrigal from the Fowl Library, uh, and I'll do the land acknowledgement. Uh, we recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Michael German, a former special FBI agent who works at the Brennan Center for Justice. Great, thanks very much, Robbie. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest today. Vita Johnson is an associate professor of law at Georgetown University Law School, where she co-directs the Criminal Justice Clinic. She previously served as a public defender and as the co-director of the E. Barrett Prettyman Program, a postgraduate training program for aspiring public defenders. She's a graduate of NYU Law School and the University of California, Berkeley. As Mary indicated, she's a repeat guest here on Conversations on Race and Policing, having participated in a 2020 panel discussion on white supremacy and law enforcement based on her article, KKK in the PD. Today, she will discuss her latest article, White Supremacy from the Bench, appearing in the Lewis and Clark Law Review. Vita, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me. Our pleasure. Um, why, why did you think it was important to interrogate racial bias in the judiciary? And, and what obstacles did you run into in trying to research your article? Okay, thanks. Um, I, and I also just wanted to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you and your listeners about my work. Um, I previously studied explicit racial bias and far right extremism and policing, but I wanted to turn my attention to judges. And this article was inspired by my eight years as a public defender in Washington, DC. As a repeat player in the legal system, we all hear the courthouse gossip and we read the court decisions. And I remember hearing a story being warned of a judge, a white judge who had told a black prosecutor um, to smile during a time when the lights were out in that courtroom. And I remember that story sort of sticking with me. And in another instance, um, the Court of Appeals reversed um, a case of my colleagues where in a bench trial, um, that judge, a different judge, um, mentioned a, the person's nationality and convicting him of a crime. And so this is an article that I had inside me for a while. But it took a while, a long time for me to really have the courage to write it. And I also had to wait for those judges to retire because um, I'm a black woman and I still represent clients through our clinic here at George Chen Law. And I wouldn't want judges to take anything out on me, but in particular, our clients. And we all like to think of judges as the smartest, most careful, most neutral, rational players in our legal system. And I know what I did when I went to law school. The Supreme Court has told us that judges are neutral and detached, and many of them are. Um, I've been in front of some of them, but just like the rest of us, there's good ones and there's bad ones, and judges are human and have very human biases. And because I was a public defender in the US, it was pretty hard to miss um, what I was seeing in courtrooms um, every day, even if the judges weren't saying things out loud like those other two judges um, that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. 
And judges have a really significant role in the lives of ordinary Americans and particularly poor people and people of color. Criminal courts, family court, evictions, civil suits, probate, name changes, weddings, jury service. There's just so many ways that people's lives are touched by judges. Many Americans just go to court. They go to court for something. And so I wanted to zoom out and see what I could find um, both about judges um, in, and explicit racial bias in the criminal legal system, but also in those other courtrooms where I wasn't spending um, any time. And I think it's important to also just keep in mind that people go to court to resol resolve issues that are in dispute. And judges get the final say in those disputes. Um, but there's a legal doctrine of judicial deference, which means that most of the time, even when a court decision is reviewed by a higher court, most of the time that decision is going to stand. And our legal system imagines that judges are neutral and has systems set in place to protect them and the reputation of our legal system. And so my research uncovered a lot of things. And I think one of the things that stands out the most to me um, is that it's very difficult to discover this type of extremely damaging bias. And I don't think it's because it's not there. There's a lot of disincentives to report a judge who's misbehaved or said something offensive um, or made a, a ruling um, that um, is out of line. A lot of people are afraid of judges. People um, fear them. And if you're a repeat player, like a lawyer, you'd have a huge disincentive to report this powerful person, this judge, because he has a great deal of power over you and your clients. And if you're not a lawyer, if you're not this kind of repeat player, it would be really hard to know how to make a complaint against a judge. Um, there's no like sign behind a judge that says, how am I doing? Uh, report a problem, call this 800 number. Um, and the complaint processes that involve courts are really difficult and really opaque. Some states require complaints to be notarized. Some require complaints to be made by mail. Very few allow anonymous complaints. Complaints are often not credited even when they are made. And even when a judge is found to have displayed bias or broken the law, 90% are allowed to stay on or retake the bench based on a, um, a 2020 study um, called the Teflon Robe by Reuters. So there's a lot of disincentives to make um, complaints against judges and a lot of reasons um, why people just wouldn't make those kinds of complaints. Um, my research found that judges have used the N-word against litigants, used racial slurs against um, other um, racial groups like Latinos. Um, a judge in Alabama said that George Floyd got what he deserved. A federal judge in Texas said that Black and Latino people are more violent than whites. A judge in Florida said that Black people should go back to Africa. An Ohio judge referred to COVID-19 as the China virus. A Montana judge used her, um, their court email to forward a racist joke about President Obama. Um, my article altogether documents about 50 instances of explicit racial bias in about the last 20 years. And I only focused on explicit racial bias. And there's all sorts of other biases that could really impact um, a judge's decision making, um, like Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism, misogyny. Um, and those could all impact the court's decision or the way he treats or she treats litigants. And it's difficult to parse the difference between a judge who's demonstrating an implicit racial bias or explicit racial bias. But for the most part, for the party who's gonna be impacted by the judge's decision, it probably doesn't matter. And so there's more stories than the ones that are documented in my article because of the limitations I put on my research. Um, I also wanted to say that I, 
the article largely focuses on the impact on litigants, but um, there's all sorts of ways that this that racial bias is going to have an impact on on people and in, involved in the court system. I don't think I know an attorney of color who hasn't um, experienced um, hasn't had the experience of being mistaken um, for their client or for a witness. Um, Brian Stevenson, um, who's one of the most respected lawyers of our time, has a similar um, experience, and I think we're going to play a clip about that. Great. <clears throat> then I'm going to play it again. Finally, another in our brief but spectacular series. Tonight, attorney Brian Stevenson, a longtime advocate for criminal justice reform, shares his thoughts on race and the legal system. I was doing a hearing in the Midwest. I had my suit and tie on. I was there early. It was the first time I'd been in that courtroom. And I sat down at defense counsel's table, as I always do, and the judge walked in and the judge said, hey, 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 you get back out there and you wait out there in the hallway until your lawyer gets here. I don't want any defendant sitting in my courtroom without their lawyer. And I stood up and I said, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Brian Stevenson. I am the lawyer. And the judge started laughing and the prosecutor started laughing and I made myself laugh because I didn't want to disadvantage my client. But afterward, I was thinking, what is it? that when this judge saw a middle-aged black man, it didn't even occur to him that that man sitting at defense counsel's table was the lawyer. And I worry about that judge. I worry that he's sentencing defendants of color more harshly. I worry that he doesn't value and accept the testimony of black and brown witnesses the way he does other people. I worry that a narrative of racial difference compromises his ability to provide fair and just treatment of all people. <laughs> I think that's a good place to stop. I don't think we're free in America. I think we are burdened by our history. Of Great. Thank you, then. Uh, Vita, can, you can continue. Sure. sure. And so, you know, at least I'm in good company. Um, uh, but it is unfortunately a common experience, I think, for uh, attorneys of color and particularly Black attorneys. But it's not just attorneys, um, a black police officer. I tell a story in the article about um, a black police officer being called a boy um, by a magistrate judge in West Virginia. And that's sort of a, a somewhat common um, uh, racial way of um, uh, insulting a, people in a racial way. Um, a white Louisiana judge referred to her court clerk and her deputy um, by calling them the N-word. And these are just people, lawyers, judges, clerks, um, police officers, um, just doing their job and being subjected to terrible um, racial bias. I tell a story of white judges complaining um, that there aren't any black judges who will cook for them, right? There's all these people who are being victimized by courts who have this type of, um, judges who have this type of bias. Um, and I don't want to suggest that all judges have these types of explicit racial biases. Um, I, the majority of them don't. Um, but I wanted to write this article because I don't think it makes sense to pretend that judges are all neutral because we know that's not true either. And we'll never be able to root out this type of um, explicit racial bias if we pretend it's not there. Keep in mind that most judges have years of education, legal education and otherwise, years of legal practice, and they know how discrimination cases get litigated and how complaints get made. So most judges, apart from the 50 who um, I document in the article, um, are very likely to be careful in what they say and do when others are watching and what words to use and what words to avoid. Um, so it's likely that the instances that I discuss in the article are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and keep in mind that um, appellate courts go out of their way not to hurt the reputation of judges. Um, the, the case I mentioned earlier um, where uh, 
the DC Court of Appeals reversed a judge in our courthouse um, for using um, someone's ethnicity and finding them guilty, the court doesn't use the word race, racism, xenophobia, any of the kinds of um, ways of characterizing the judge's conduct in that case. And in some states, judicial disciplinary records aren't made available and aren't public at all. Um, and the way I did my research was by canvassing um, news media reports, but you know, you've know, got to have the press um, either there in the courtroom or someone has to tip them off for there to be a news story about it. Um, and judicial opinions need to actually be public for people to read them and they actually have to characterize the behavior um, as having a racial element or at least being offensive um, for um, anyone to be able to connect the dots. And so we really don't have um, much idea um, of how large of a problem this is. We just don't know um, to what extent it, it causes a problem, but we know it is one. Um, and I think it's also important to kind of zoom out and keep in mind that um, there's a long history of um, of race and racism in our courts. Um, we had a Supreme Court justice, um, Justice Hugo Black, who was a member of the KKK before he joined the bench. Um, we know the profession was dominated by white males until very recently. The first woman federal judge was in 1928. We didn't have the first black federal judge um, until 20 years later. And it wasn't until 20 years after that that we had the first black woman federal judge in the late 1960s. This is not a diverse profession and it will likely never be diverse because resources in our country are not distributed equally. And it takes a lot of resources to complete seven years of education after high school. Um, so it shouldn't come to, uh, shouldn't come as a surprise that courts can and do sometimes perpetuate racism. We really like to think of courts as changing the law um, when it comes to discrimination in positive ways, right? We think about cases like Brown versus Board of Education that called for the desegregation of schools um, or Loving versus Virginia, which allowed people of different races to marry in the United States or Basson versus Kentucky, which outlawed some types of racism and jury selection. But there's also another side of the work that courts have done um, to perpetuate racism. We know that um, judges sentence black defendants more harshly than their white counterparts, even when you control for criminal history and employment. You know, the black parents are more likely to lose um, custody of their children to the neglect system than white parents. There are numerous studies on this um, and some really important work by um, Dorothy Roberts. Um, and courts and judges have undone a number of important um, legislative protections for people of color. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1871, known as the um, Ku Klux Klan Act, um, which is now how we um, how people sue police um, through uh, Section 1983. That the Supreme Court developed the doctrine of qualified immunity to limit individuals' ability to sue police. Um, we know that um, from a really great law review article um, written by a Vanderbilt law professor, Jessica Clark, that um, courts have made it harder to sue employers for racism on the job through a doctrine called the Stray Remarks Doctrine. Um, professor Brandon Har Har Hasbrook made a very similar case for the ways that courts have made it easier um, for uh, landlords and harder for plaintiffs to prove race discrimination in housing in, in an article he wrote. We know that the Supreme Court gutted um, the 1965 Voting Rights Act in its 2013 case, Shelby County versus Holder. Um, since that decision, a thousand polling places in Black communities have closed. So we know that courts um, perpetuate racial um, inequities through the through their legal decisions. 
And I think it's time that we think about who we give this power to um, and why we give this kind of power um, to courts and how to how to rectify things. Uh, when I think about it, I think, you know, every day, a disproportionate number of white people sit in judgment of and make decisions about a disproportionate number of people of color. And, you know, there are some important structural um, ways that that has come to to pass, um, but we need to be careful with it. Um, and we won't root out racism and particularly explicit racial bias if we pretend that this type of bias doesn't exist. And so I wrote the article hoping to, to shine a light on this problem um, because I think it's an area that needs more attention. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer to your very brief question, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. No, that that was that was fantastic. And uh, uh, number one, thank you for writing the article. Um, what government agency, independent agency, is responsible for uh, investigating judges when they're accused of misconduct, or uh, uh, responsible for meeting out discipline, or at least collecting data about the discipline that occurs? There really isn't one. Um, so I think. Um, Arguably, voters, um, you know, have a say in who becomes judges. Um, some state judges are elected, um, and um, otherwise, judges are appointed. And so, it's usually um, appointed by, um, like, in, in the case of federal judges, appointed by the president. And so, who, you know, voting um, matters, um, and because for so many reasons, but also. Um, because of judicial um, nominations, um, but there is no, um, Congress can um, impeach federal judges, but they haven't. Um, uh, I think just a handful of judges in maybe the 1800s have been impeached. It's a pretty rare thing. Um, so really isn't a body that's um, doing the hard work of investigating judges across the country. Mary, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, we, we have been, as I suggested earlier, we've been doing this for a number of years now, uh, three years, and uh, it's very, very difficult to distinguish between a personal racist problem and a systemic racist problem. And I'm wondering if you can help our audience make that distinction. What's the difference between, you know, Joe in the hallway outside of court using the N-word and a judge speaking from the bench and, and its impact? Yeah, I hope I made a, that clear. That's a great question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. So, you know, I, th I think generally there's probably three kind of buckets of racism that that I think about. There's unconscious bias, unconscious racial bias. So I think all of us have. Um, it's, it's the sort of the biases that we kind of carry just from being exposed to social media, from, um, you know, things our parents said that we don't, we're not conscious of. And then there's the explicit racial bias. So those biases that we have that we're very much aware of, right? The, I don't like him or I don't like those people. Does it, you know, it's often, I often describe it as like racial animus, like racial hatred that's in your heart, but I don't really think it needs to be um, that intense. I don't actually think it needs to be like hatred for it to still be a bias. Um, but that's, I think that's an easy way for people to conceptualize it. And then there's structural racism. And those are the sort of the things that judges have a big role in these um, decisions that get made that truly impact the health, well being, and financial outcomes of um, communities of color. So the decision to allow um, a highway to go through a, a historic Black community and, and, 
um, move people out of their homes and deprive them of their the wealth that they could have created in that community. Um, the the you know, redlining, all these legal um, things that took place that we that courts oversaw um, that al that allow for racism that allow for these racist outcomes, even if they're not explicit um, in terms of um, why the rulings came out the way they did, but it's the sort of structural, the, the, the systemic problems that, that um, lead to unfairnesses. I hope, I hope that answers that question. And I think it, it shows in the uh, sentencing disparities that, that you mentioned, um, where that implicit or unconscious bias is, is easy to demonstrate through data. Uh, but once that implicit bias is recognized, how many judges, for instance, go to implicit bias training to try to correct those biases and make sure that that the system is is improving itself. Right, absolutely. That's a great example, Mike. Um, and then that, the fact that there are so many people um, who are Black, who are behind bars or have been um, sentenced, you know, charged with that felony instead of that misdemeanor or sentenced to prison instead of probation creates some structural issues, not just for those, not just the 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 experience of those individuals, but structural issues for their entire communities um, because they're deprived of wealth, they're deprived of the, of the franchise and unable to vote, um, those sorts of things that create all sorts of other injustices that, that get perpetuated. That just can also reinforce people's um, um, unconscious biases that, oh, you know, and conscious biases that, you know, those those people um, don't vote or those people are poor, um, these sorts of things that seem very hidden. Yes, and Robbie, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Professor Johnson, for this illuminating uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, in your article, you write, um, in, in referencing Wren versus United States in 1996, um, you write that uh, judges um, have allowed police to stop, harass, and search people based on their race as long as there is a legal excuse or believed excuse. Could you describe what, what, what was Wren versus the United States and how does that impact uh, people of color? So Wren was the case that allowed um, courts to, or sorry, allowed police to um, stop individuals based on a pretext. So as long as there was some legal justification for the stop, let's say an illegal right turn um, at a stoplight, for example, um, as long as there was some legal justification for the stop, then if the real reason the police were interested in stopping that car was a pretext and was not the actual law violation that that tr that illegal turn, um, that police were justified in making that stop. And that was illegally um, viable stop, which meant that the proceeds of whatever was recovered in the stop and subsequent search could be used in court. That really opened the doors for police to harass people, right? Because as long as they could come up with some um, reason that they wanted to further investigate, which unfortunately um, could be based on things like a hunch or um, a gut feeling, as long as there was some law violation um, along with that, um, the Supreme Court said that's a, that's an okay thing for police to do. And that along with the case called Terry versus Ohio, which also meant that police could stop people on less than probable cause, less than what the um, the Constitution itself, the Fourth Amendment itself says is required to stop and search someone that those two decisions really led to a, just a large scale system of stop and frisk where innocent people living their lives are forced to interact with police against their will in very humiliating and sometimes violent encounters. Um, and it, it, you know, really a, a a big setback for civil liberties in this country. Thank you. Thanks, great question. 
Um, you have an interesting statistic in your, and, and I should say for, uh, for audience members, if you want to type a question into the uh, Q&A, we'll make sure and try to get it uh, asked and answered. Um, but you have an interesting statistic in the, in the article uh, that talks about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the effects of diversity among fact finders. And uh, as you point out, the, uh, the, the research is mostly around jurors rather than judges. Uh, but, but just having one black juror on a panel can increase the rate of acquittals by 16%. Uh, what is what is the diversity rate in in the judiciary, and do you think at increasing diversity is a, a a an effective way of trying to reform the institution? I I think that's such a great question. I actually don't know the answer to it, though. I I I have a suspicion. Um, so, for example, we know that um, you know black um, judges and black prosecutors and um, black pros I said prosecutors, black judges and prosecutors played a significant role in mass incarceration. There's a great book um, called Locking Up Our Own that was written by James Foreman, um, where he discusses that. So it's, I don't know um, what the actual, um, what the outcome of having a more diverse bench would be but I suspect that it couldn't hurt. Um, we know, um, unfortunately, that um, about 10% of the population um, holds extreme views on race and racism and is willing um, to answer questions to pollers, um, pollsters about, about their views. And they tend to be um, more likely to be white uh, people who hold those views. And so if you have a bench that's not very diverse, um, I think it raises the chances for um, there to be um, a, you know, a higher percentage, as much as 10% um, of people who hold extreme views on race um, on the bench. And that number's scary when you think about the millions of cases that get decided every year on really important um, issues um, by judges. I mean, we we like to think that um, jurors decide um, a lot of the, the legal questions of our day, but it's really not true. The number of jury trials um, that that um, are happening in courthouses around the United States has, has been going down for several decades. Um, it's mostly judges that make important decisions in individuals' lives, not not jurors. And so um, it, yeah, I, I, wait, I don't know the answer to your question, but I, I think we should all find out. Yeah. And um, one of the issues that you do discuss in in the article is uh, the the problem with private penalties and a private discipline that happens in the system. Can you explain the difference between the the public charges and, and the the private discipline that you talk about? Sure. So um, sometimes when a, there's a complaint against a judge, um, the judicial body that's um, reviewing um, the judge's conduct and most states have um, judicial have um, bodies that basically are policing judges um, conduct and they're often made up by other judges and lawyers. Um, oftentimes they give them private reprimands. Um, and so everyone's not aware that the judge has received um, kind of a, a, a note in his file or, you know, a, a, a letter of warning. Um, and that keeps judges in their position. Um, maybe they get elevated to a court of appeals. Um, maybe they go on to some other um career, but without that, um, that mark on their record and without litigants having the knowledge of who they're appearing in front of. Um, and, and I, that's disturbing. The public is paying judges salaries and they should have some information about their track record, um, and decide how they want to proceed and be able to make motions to recuse in, in some instances. Mary. 
Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, our colleague Jeremy um, Murray has posted or, or uh, pasted uh, the link to your article, Professor Johnson, in the chat. So for our audience, it's a, it's a quite a lengthy article, but it's pretty fascinating, I think, and and not uh, as um, sort of dry as many of our academic articles are. So please don't be afraid when you see that there are like 89 pages to <laughs> this little book here. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention, and just to sort of uh, underscore your question about um, diversity in the judiciary, Michael, um, there's a concept in the social sciences called tokenism. And that says, that uh, if you've got 20 judges in a particular court and you've only got one judge of color, um, that's gonna make it very, very difficult for that judge of color to speak out. So what, what researchers suggest is that a certain percentage of, you know, like a critical mass of judges of color who, are, um, who, who, who get the courage based on that mass to, uh, to speak up and to um, call for censure or whatever. But just to know that one black or one brown or one Asian judge is, uh, is not gonna do it, you know, because uh, he or she doesn't have the power to, to effect change um, if it's just one voice. And I'll just add to that, I mean, there's so many other issues at play in terms of who becomes a judge and who wants to sit in judgment of others. Um, I mean, it's a really weird job, right? To think that I am superior at making decisions about other people's lives, right? Like that's a, that's a type. And I, and I'll, I'll say the, the thing that the racists say sometimes, like some of my best friends are judges and they, they really are. I have good friends who are judges. Um, but it is a very interesting um, career. And it's a career that um, it really focuses on elite credentials, right? So you have to go to college, you have to do well enough in college that you can get into law school um, and also take the standardized testing that would get you into law school. And then you have to do well enough in, in law school that you have the credentials that would get you to a, a, a fancy enough job that you could eventually become a judge. Typically that's prosecutors. Typically the, peop, the, the profession that is most likely to become judges is prosecutors. And when you run for election in these states that require um, judges to be elected, a lot of times judges are running on tough on crime um, campaigns. And so there's just, there's so, so much tied up in that in terms of race and racism and in, in, in our ideas of what is a crime, right? Like we don't think of like environmental pollution um, or um, wage theft as crimes in the same way that we think of as the guy who shoplifts from the CVS as a criminal, um, even though the impact in the first two crimes that I described is much more broad and impacts many more people. But our our whole tough on crime, um, I don't know, culture in this country um, really is going to attract a certain type of person who is going to want to become a judge. And again, those elite credentials are also going to insulate you from certain communities, right? Judges, you know, I'll just say like federal judges make like $200,000 a year, right? So these are people who are, you know, living very privileged lives that are really distant from the experiences of everyday Americans and many parts. So there's so many different issues at play um, in our, and who becomes a judge who, and who wants to become a judge. And I, I saw um, a question in the chat about Batson. Um, and Batson is that case that I mentioned in my talk that um, basically made um, discrimination, some types of um, discrimination, um, illegal um, in jury selection. But it's a really 
you know, Batson is a case that is largely considered a failure because it was really focused on um, explicit racial bias that is expressed by a prosecutor. And most prosecutors are not going to um, express racial bias in striking a prospective juror. And so it's really hard um, to um, enforce Batson. Um, and so it's just one of those cases that we think of, oh, it's, it's great, that what a great decision, but it doesn't mean anything in practice. Likewise, Brown versus Board of Education, like it's great that we outlawed um, racial uh, segregation, but actually schools are more segregated now than they were before Brown was decided from what I understand. So it's just, we've got a lot of like nice sounding decisions from courts. And again, these are also decisions from the 60s and 70s, um, but, the, but their impact is pretty limited. Yeah, and, and I think that goes to your point about how the the court made doctrines sometimes uh, cement the systemic uh, racism in, in the system. Robbie, you had a question. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, I just wanted to mention, that, um, Professor Johnson, in your article, you mentioned some of the the nomenclature uh, with respect used with respect to judges, and as well as some um, the practices like when the judge walks in, everyone stands, your honor, superior court judge, so-and-so. So that sort of reinforces it and elevates the status of the judge. And uh, and you you, wrote, you note in your article that judges are very powerful and many fear them. And there, there are a number of, of videos on YouTube in which a police officer pulls over a speeding judge. And then that officer shows a lot of deference to that, to that, to the judge. And, uh, and you also note in, in your article that um, the legal system is also difficult to navigate, even for attorneys. So that's a very sobering reality for, for us lay folks who don't know anything about the legal system. So we're at severe uh, disadvantage when it comes to um, judges who, who may harbor these um, racist attitudes. I, I think that's absolutely right. I think it is really difficult to navigate these systems. Um, and I think, unfortunately, it's by design. Um, judges often are the ones that are creating these rules about how to govern themselves. Um, and so it is easy to imagine why it might be difficult. And then there are all these people who respect judges or who benefit from um, having a close relationship with the judge. And so it might be unlikely um, to want to do anything that puts them in a bad light, like find them, find that they willfully, um, uh, you know, made a decision based on race. Uh, I think a lot about courts of appeals, um, you know, people are always like, well, I'm just going to appeal that decision. Well, who are we taking that appeal to? We're taking it to another judge or another, you know, set of judges. And those judges are going to go to the same judicial trainings, the same judicial conferences, maybe even eat in the same judicial dining room as the trial court judges. So, you know, I'm not saying that court of appeal judges can't be neutral and can't, um, you know, decide cases fairly, but I definitely think that there is a coziness there um, that helps um, keep judicial power where it is. And Mary? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I, I don't wanna keep you, we don't wanna keep you, Professor Johnson. We see we're, we're sort of running out of time, but um, I, I think for my last question, uh, one of the ways that we have been thinking about um, spreading the message, if you will, uh, because you know, there's always been the complaint in the uh, about the ivory tower. You know, we we are talking about this stuff among amongst ourselves, um, but and we're outraged, of course. But how do we get this information to the public? And one of the ways we try to do this is through um, our our podcast. Uh, what other ways? would you suggest that the general public get this information? I know that you've, you've done some, um, some editorial writing for newspapers around the country. 
Um, what do you think? Oh, I think you guys are doing a tremendous service. I do think that state legislatures could, um, you know, have a more transparent way to make um, complaints about judges. I think um, there could certainly, um, you know, states that don't allow anonymous complaints, you know, could, for example, there's a lot of ways where we could change the way that we review judges' decisions and discipline judges um, and make it less easy for um, the problem judges to stay on the bench. And, you know, you just have to ask any lawyer who the problem judges are. Everyone knows who they are. It's just there's no benefit to them to expose them. If you're complaining about a judge, they're going to take it out on you that you complained. And if you're benefiting from their bias, you don't want to report them because you're benefiting and your clients are benefiting, whoever they may be. And so, you know, there are other, we could have like neutral um, observers who come in um, and, you know, without, you know, announcing who they are, just watch judges. Most courtrooms are open to the public um, and anyone can walk in and, and watch. Um, I think um, the press could play an important role. Um, but, you know, it is really a difficult problem. And you, you mentioned the two systems, the federal system of lifetime appointments, but some states have elections. In, in your research, were you able to get enough data to see whether one system was was better than the other at holding judges accountable? I really wasn't. Um, and it wasn't the focus of the article. It really just was like a first um, um time of, of thinking about explicit bias and judges. Um, but I, it, it would be hard to imagine that it could have a big impact because I think even if a judge did have a track record for um, making biased decisions, I'm not sure that it would trickle, to, that information would trickle down to the voter um, in a way that, that, that would have an impact. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure there's some exceptions, you know, I hope that there are some exceptions to that for sure. I just, I just want to, just, I'm sorry, Michael, go ahead if, if you have a follow up. Uh, well, I was just gonna ask number one, you mentioned um, having some concern when when you came across judges who, who made remarks uh, that you thought were inappropriate. Have you received any pushback from the article or, or any? I, I assume you're still practicing some. I am. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was really nervous when it came out, but it turns out not many people read law review articles. It's just the three of us, I think. Um, and so um, I, I have not I haven't I haven't even heard a, 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 a peep from my um, judge friends. So I think yeah. I, I I, I think it's like our articles on on the racist policing. I expected a lot of pushback, but it's something everybody kind of quietly acknowledges without uh, without doing the things necessary like you did to actually start asking these hard questions. So I appreciate that, Mary. I, I, I lied. I I have one more question, but I also want to preface that by by thanking you personally for joining us today. Uh, and you know, the third time is a charm, so we expect you back at least one more time. Uh, but I, my question was, when can we expect you to kick off your campaign uh, for for um, for federal judge? Or not? Um, no, federal yeah. judges are pro are are are, are uh, appointed. So yes, that's right. You have to be um, a judge some somewhere down the line. I don't. I don't know that um, that's in the cards for me. I think I'm too much of an advocate for that. But um, yes, I, I really appreciate the sentiment though behind that comment. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. And um, yeah, I look forward to writing something that will get me invited back. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks so much for the work that you've been doing and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share it with the public. So very quickly, um, I just want to jump in. Uh, Jeremy Murray, and I want to thank Finn Lee, uh, an information technology consultant here at CSUSB for working, uh, keeping us all um, keeping us all going and all, all matters tech related. And also Pamela Cross in the history department for all of her work behind the scenes in administrative support. Um, support for the event also comes from the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee 
here at CSUSB and the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. So thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, thanks especially to our guest, Professor Vita Johnson, for making the time to join us today. Thank you all thanks so much. Everyone. Be well. Bye.